duties incumbent upon me, the duties incumbent upon me as a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. As a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. So congratulations to Jamie Garvin, Sarah Lennon, Jessica Sullivan for Town Council, and Heather Altenberg, Elizabeth Sifries, and John Boltz for School Board. Uh, moving on to the roll call by the Town Clerk, Deborah. Councilor Garvin. Here. Councilor Grennan. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor McCausland. Here. Councilor Ray. Here. And Councilor Sullivan. Here. Thank you very much. We have a group of people leaving, so we'll give them just maybe a few seconds. So moving on to item uh, one is the election of the town council chair. Is there a motion, please? Patty. I move that we um, accept Molly McCausland as the chair of town council for the coming year. Thank you, Patty. Is there a second? Caitlin, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Congratulations, Molly. Thank you. And we will change seats. <laughs> I've ever it's seen quiet. it in here. <laughs> First of all, let me say thank you. I'm honored to be elected chair of the council. My thanks to my fellow council members for their support, and I look forward to a productive and engaging year ahead. Also, welcome to new council member Jamie Garvin. And welcome back to newly re-elected council members, Jessica Sullivan and Sarah Lennon. Congratulations to all. I'd also like to thank outgoing council members, Jim Walsh and Jamie Wagner, for their service to the community. And next, it is my privilege to recognize and thank Councillor Ray for her long list of contributions to the town of Cape Elizabeth. After serving for eight years on the school board, Kathy joined the council, chairing the ordinance committee for two years and representing our town as a delegate to the MMA Legislative Policy Committee. I've had the opportunity to work with Kathy for the last three years, first as a member of the Library Planning Committee and more recently as a member of the Library Building Committee. Kathy was re-elected to her second term on the council last year and it's been a pleasure serving under her leadership as council chair in 2015. Kathy, thank you for a job well done. We have a small gift for you acknowledging your service and your dedication to the town. Thank you. Thank you very much, Molly. Molly asked me to open it, so I will. <laughs> it's always a little awkward when you do this, but oh, how lovely. Um, most people don't know, but I um, love clocks. And my husband's probably at home going, oh no, not another one. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thank you. just want to say a couple words Please and I, I will be brief I'm usually brief but anyway I'd like to thank um, thank you for the honor of being this year's chair I couldn't have done it without the support of the town council and the superior town staff including Mike McGovern so thank you 
Thank you, Kathy. Shall we move along? And the yes, Jessica. With your permission, I'd like to say a few words. Please do. Um, you know, there are different styles of leadership and chairmanship. Kathy came to her year as chairman of the town council with more skills than most because she'd been elected twice chairman of the school board during her eight years there. And it's easy to see why they elected her twice. She quietly attended her duties as chairman and always made sure that the council was duly informed of any issues it needed to face. And as with any year, we, we had our share. She approached all the issues with honesty, transparency, and integrity. She never shied away from tough issues, and her guiding principles always led her to the same questions. What are the facts, and what is best for the town as a whole? I think that it's been particularly serendipitous that during this year, Cape Elizabeth's 250th anniversary, our town has been led by the chairman who is a direct descendant of Reverend Robert Jordan, the first settler of Cape Elizabeth. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you, Kathy. Would anybody else like to say anything? Okay. Thanks again, Kathy. <clears throat> Shall we move on to town council reports and correspondence? Does that, <clears throat> anyone have anything that they would like to bring up? Nope. Wonderful. We'll move on to the finance committee report. We're in transition right now. I think the manager is going to speak to us tonight on update on the finance. Thank you, Chair McCausland. You're welcome. Right, once a year, we, we ask, there's a, there's a provision in the council rules that we ask the uh, chair of the town council, do they prefer to be known as chairman, chair, or chairperson, or something else, and you decided town council chair. Chair, so correct. I'll try to remember that. Thank you. Uh, so, congratulations. I, I, I do want to indicate on the finances, we're in, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, the, the dashboard shows that, uh, particularly excise taxes, people continue to buy a lot of new cars. It's up almost 9% over what it was a year ago. Uh, revenue sharing is, uh, is, is up by 27%, but the way the state system works, that ex we expect that will be level at the end of the year. While building permit income is down, it is still tracking uh, within budget. Uh, cable franchise fee we won't know for a while. Uh, and Portland had like gift shop sales. Uh, the, the fiscal year goes from July to June, and while now we've closed for the season, I think it's important to note that we're already at 93% of budget, and we still have you know May and June to be open. So uh, that looks good. I expenses, you know, things are going well. No one has yet asked, "Are you running over the public works budget because of the snow?" Uh, <laughs> but let's hope we don't get those questions uh, mm -hmm. coming up. But overall, things are in things are in good shape. Good. Anyone? Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Yes, Jessica. Um, the, um, uh, I don't have it open, but I was reviewing it. There's the 115 uh, percent over on public works due to the tall ships uh, this summer. Wasn't that the notation? We were. I think that's on the fuel. Or is that on fuel? Fuel. Was that, that on fuel? One? That was last year, I think. Okay. Fuel. Yeah. All right. Um, hey, what number? I, I'm trying to see what number. I'm not getting the, the 115 percent. Yeah, 115. Diesel yeah. And gasoline. Oh, that was the gasoline and diesel. Yeah, and, and yeah. Okay, that wasn't the. No, and if you look, that's the percentage compared to a year ago. Okay. And we're still dealing with very small overall percentages. We've spent 38 percent in that account at the end of November. It should be 41 percent. Okay. So it's a matter of timing of when uh, deliveries come in. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else questions? No. Thank you, Mike. Citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Do we have citizens who would like to speak tonight? Seeing none, I'll move on. <clears throat> Town manager's monthly report. Yes, I, with, with the other work you have to do this evening, I have a brief report. I just want to join you in uh, congratulating uh, the continuing counselors, the new counselors, and indicate that uh, you know, I'm looking forward to your workshop this evening. Uh, to look forward to what the council's goals are. And I know all of the staff looks forward to working with you in, uh, in implementing those goals. So, thank you. Wonderful. Anything else? No, that's no. it for tonight. Great. Any questions for the manager? <clears throat> no? 
We'll move on to item number 2-2016, adoption of town council rules. Can I have a motion to accept the adoption of the town council rules? I think we have the, maybe the minutes before that. Did I skip that? Oh, review of draft meeting minutes. Thank you. That's from the November 4th, 2015 meeting. Do I have a motion to accept those? So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion, questions, comments, corrections, revisions? No? Question, Molly. Yes. Point of procedure for the new counselors that were not on the council at the last meeting. Right. Um, I know that there's no abstaining uh, for votes, but uh, I, so I assume we just vote as if we were here or? I'm going to look to the manager yeah. for advice on you know, that. There, there are certain things that one do. It's, it, the term is a ministerial responsibility. Yep. And you know, for example, even if, like for example, a, a liquor license, you oppose it, everyone still signs it because you signed it as the council group. Yeah, the same with, with approving you know, minutes of a meeting that you weren't at. You still you still vote on them uh, as a as a ministerial responsibility. Very good. All good. Any other questions? Discussion? No. All in favor? Any opposed? No. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Now we'll move on to item number two dash two thousand sixteen adoption of town council rules. I move we adopt the town council rules for this year. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Patty. Any discussion? No? Are we ready to vote? All in favor? Any opposed? No? Thank you. Unanimous. So far, so good. As chair, I have to say, it's going pretty smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> Item number 3-2016, appointment of the Finance Committee. Uh, the caucus had recommended Catherine N. Ray as chair and the council as a whole to serve as the finance committee. Do I have a motion? Jessica. I move that we accept Catherine Ray as chairman and the council as a whole to serve, the, serve as the finance committee. Thank you. Do I have a second? I will second that. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? passes and we'll move on to item number 4-2016 appointment of an ordinance committee the caucus recommends Caitlin Jordan as chair and Sarah Lennon and Jessica Sullivan as the members do I have a motion yes Jessica um, yes I'd like to move to divide the item and to separate the election of chairman from the body as a whole I didn't support Council Jordan as chairman and I'd like to remain consistent with that do I need a second to move to, oh, mm -hmm. as to whether to accept that motion or whether to uh, take it, a second on it? I, I, I'm not sure what the rule is on a motion to divide a question. Do you know, Deborah? If whether or not it requires a second to, to divide an issue? I think it would. Yeah. That's my, this will of the council. I will take a second on that if anyone would like to move it. I'll second it. Thank you, Kathy. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of dividing that? All in favor of dividing that motion? Opposed? That motion does not pass. We'll move back to the initial which is item 4-2016. Do I have a motion? Yes, Councillor Lennon. I move that we appoint um, Caitlin Jordan as chairman and Sarah Lennon and Jessica Sullivan as members of the ordinance committee for this year. Thank you, do I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Garvin. Any other discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Just one. Thank you. We will move on to item number 5-2016, appointment of an appointments committee. The caucus recommended Patricia Grennan as chair and Jamie Garvin and Catherine Ray as members. Do I have a motion? 
Yes, thank you, Caitlin. I move that we appoint Patty Grennan as chair with Jamie Garvin and Catherine N. Ray as members. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Nope, that's unanimous. Wonderful. Next item is listed as a consent agenda that we consider items number 6 through 18-2016 on block. The council chair will entertain a single motion to approve items 6 through 18. However, any councilor may request for any item to re be removed from the consent list and separately voted. Do I have a motion? Yes. I move that we accept items 6 through 18 as a uh, consent agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? No? All in favor? That motion passes. Thank you. So I just have to ask a procedural question now. We voted to consider that on block. Does that mean that we voted to all move done. all of those items? Yeah. Wonderful. So now we are moving. You do need to sign the Code of Ethics. You have the cheat down? Correct. Yeah. Great. We have multiple copies. <coughs> no? Just one? Just one. Okay. Shall I start and sure. we'll go in either direction? Back to you, and you can send it in that direction. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. Oh, this says you're oh, witnessed by you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we'll move on to item number 19 2016, the appointments to boards and commissions. Would the uh, new chair of the appointments committee like to introduce this item? Yes. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, in October, we posted openings um, for asking community members to apply uh, to different boards and commissions for um, vacancies. Um, or as well for reappointment to the different committees in the town. Um, we held in November three nights of interviews, and um, it, it was actually a really great turnout. We had over 31 people come out for inter to, to interview for the positions, um, with only 21 positions available. Um, so in a minute, I will present the, each of the people who we have nominated on the slate. Um, but I do want to say to those who we were unable to put into the committees that um, please come back. We had an incredible, again, as I said, turnout, and also um, a great opportunity to meet some incredible people from our community who are um, talented and committed to this um, community, but unfortunately, we just didn't have enough um, places for them at this time. I guess that's a good problem to have, and hopefully um, the next time around that we can find placements for them. Um, so would you like me just to go through and read or make a motion at this point? I think we probably, I, I'm guessing everyone received a copy of the full list in their packet. So um, if you'd like to, you can read it or we can just um, have a motion to accept the full slate as okay. Is that fine? Okay, great. Um, so I would like to move that we accept um, the slate as you received it um, for um, all the different boards and commissions for the 2016 year with appointments beginning December 31st and ending on different terms that are listed here. Wonderful. Thank you. Do we have a second? Thank you. Jamie? 
Do we have any discussion? Any questions? Yes, Caitlin. Oh, just given the code of ethics that we just signed, I do have to disclose that I am distantly related to one of the recommendations, Caroline Jordan, and we are it's a close personal friend. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other discussion? Terrific. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? No, nope. that is unanimous. Great, we'll move on to item number 20-2016, the Proputic Club Annual Licenses. Yes, Jessica. Yes, uh, Chair McCausland, I need to disclose that I'm a member of the Proputa Club. I don't feel that that would um, impede my ability to make an objective decision regarding their license. Thank you. Does anyone need to weigh in on that? I agree with you. I thank you for disclosing it. I don't see any conflict there. Great. Could I have a motion? The proposal is to approve the annual malt, vinous, spirituous, mobile service bar, and special amusement permits for the Proputa Club located at 300 Spurwink Avenue. <clears throat> yes, Sarah. Uh, I propose we approve the annual malt, vinous, spirit, and mobile service bar special amusement at the Paputa Club at 300 Spurwick Avenue. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? No? All in favor? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. No one opposed? Do we have to sign something on that? Or we'll do that after the meeting. Great. Thank you. Next up, we have item number 21-2016, the analysis of the Spurwing Church intersection. Michael, would you like to introduce this item? Uh, thank you, Chair McCausland. One of the town council goals for this uh, calendar year that's about to end uh, was to look at a couple of intersections in town, uh, and one in particular. Uh, is the intersection properly known as the Spurwink Church intersection. Uh, it's uh, the intersection of Spurwink Avenue and Bowery Beach Road, I believe, but it, it's kind of odd the way it, the, the road the name, the Route 77. Anyway, I, I think anyone that travels through that intersection know it feels uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that probably relates to why the council asked for, for, for a goal. Uh, we did ask our town engineering firm, uh, Sebago Technics, uh, to look at it and the, uh, are we warming up? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm trying to stall while the thing warms up. And uh, the, the agenda indicates that Steve Harding, the town engineer, is going to be present to review and present the analysis. But I understand you're not doing that. No, I'm sticking you got, you got to go to the mic there. Michael's correct. I'm not going to present it. I have Steve Sawyer, who's a transportation engineer, much more knowledgeable about such things. But I did want to introduce myself and reintroduce myself to some of you folks. My name's Steve Harding. I've been a town engineer for a long time, and I work for Sebago Technics. So. And just while Steve's coming up, I think it, it should be mentioned that when, when he was uh, earlier in his career with Hunter Blue Associates and T.Y. Lynn back in the early 90s, he was actually the town engineer before Steve. Uh, a few years back, in the late 80s, early 90s, maybe? I think so. You're right. You have an excellent memory. That's right. So welcome. That is true. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, now, you have to tell me one more thing, because I'm not technologically savvy to apples, but how do we, is it just? Is it coming? Oh, look at that. How about, oh, now I have to put in that, uh, excuse me just a minute here while we, we ah, there we go. That. All right. Awesome. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, it's my understanding that you did, as part of your packet, get a copy of a memorandum that we prepared for Bob Malley, your public works director, on this particular intersection. Um, he asked us back in September to take a look at it uh, from a safety and an operational standpoint, and we made, we, we produced, we did just that. We went into the field and, and made some uh, observations uh, of how things, as we saw them, um, reacted. We also did some background research on uh, 
crash histories at the intersection to see if, in fact, there was anything there that would lead us to believe uh, we needed to make some improvements. Um, and that led us to the preparation of a memorandum. And I'm going to go through some of the findings that, that we came up with uh, based on our observations and then look for the council to give us some direction as to where we might go from here. Um, as for those of you that did have a chance to read the memo in completeness, you'll, you will notice or you should have noticed that we did not make any recommendations. It was really just a presentation of what we saw as facts uh, and with the expectation that um, indeed tonight's conversation might lead us to some follow-up action uh, based on what your pleasure is. But some of the things that we noticed uh, really is um, there's a limited sight distance as you go around the curve. The curve is fairly sharp, as, as those of you who travel it on a, on a routine basis. Um, and it's not graded correctly in terms of if you're heading towards Scarborough as you drive around the outside of the curve. The road is actually banked in the wrong direction. Uh, so that makes you feel uncomfortable, I think was the word that was used earlier. As you're driving it, the centrifugal force of your car actually makes you feel like you're going to sort of run off the road. And actually, I think Bob, although uh, not, nothing has happened recently, but he mentioned that at some point someone actually did go around the outside of the curve and hit the church, uh, which is on the outside of the curve, and maybe that had some con contributing factor to, to uh, that happening. Um, the other thing that he pointed out was... Um, the sight distance, the church is fairly close to the roadway, and um, there's the grass parking lot across the across Berwick Road, and so pedestrians, when they come to a service or to some activity at the church, park in the parking lot, and then they walk across the road, and the sight distance for people coming from Scarborough is, is obstructed by the church, and there was a concern for safety of pedestrians crossing from the parking lot over to the church, so we asked that we take a look at that as well. So the first thing we did, and, and typically do in a situation like this is we take a look at the documented crash history. And for that, what we do is there's a resource at the state of Maine, the Maine Department of Transportation maintains a, um, an excellent database of crash history all across the state. And what we asked them to provide us was a report that would indicate to us uh, what, the, what the history looked like between their most recent three-year window. And that, would, that, as it turned out, happened to be between 2012 and 2014. And as you can see, this diagram here is a representation of what appears to be four crashes that occurred during that four-year period. Now, if you dig into the report a little bit more in detail, you'll find out that there was one crash in 2012. There were no crashes in 2013, and there were three crashes in 2014. And of the three crashes that occurred in 2014, I've highlighted three of them. One of them was over here, and this happened to be a person making a left-hand turn on, uh, from Bowery Beach onto Spurwick Avenue and ran into a bicyclist. And that particular incident actually incurred um, an incapacitating injury to the bicycle person, or according to the accident report. There also was another accident whereby a motorcycle was involved. And that, the motorcycle person actually got hit by uh, someone coming in the other direction. So those are the, probably the two worst inc incidents that involved an injury. Um, the other one, the other two accidents, one was a vehicle that was actually coming from Scarborough making a left-hand turn and actually ran into somebody sitting right here at the stop sign. Um, it's, sometimes it's hard to understand how things happen, but that's what the accident report actually said. Um, and then the fourth accident was somebody in uh, the wintertime just lost control of the vehicle as they were going around the corner and actually ended up in a snowbank. So <clears throat> those are the four crashes. Now. To understand crash history and the significance of crash history, there are two factors that, that the state of Maine um, uses to quantify the severity of the safety problem at an intersection. One of them is the number of crashes that occur in the most recent three-year period, and that threshold is eight. So here we have four. The state uses a factor of eight in order to elevate it to what's considered a high crash location. The second criteria is a uh, indicator called critical rate factor, 
and that's a measure of how often crashes occur at this intersection versus other similar accidents or other similar intersections across the state. So it's a measure of relativity. Um, and it turned out you have to have a critical rate factor greater than one. Or in other words, it has to have a preponderance of, of safety concerns greater than what the average intersection might be that looks like this across the state. Here we have a critical rate factor of 1.58. So it meets that threshold, but you have to meet both thresholds in order to be considered a high crash location. So in terms of the state's eyes, this is not a high crash location, and it's just one that has some concerns and has a crash history, but would not elevate to the point where they would um, suggest that it needs to be on their radar screen to do something about. Just a little bit of history there in terms of how this relates from a crash history point of view, because sometimes that's tied to um, eligibility for funding, at least from the state point of view. Just a couple of photographs here. This is what you see when you're coming from Scarborough. Uh, the church is on the left, the curve to the right. Uh, the, the important thing here is uh, you notice that there's a um, plowed field on the right and the vegetation is fairly low as you're approaching uh, from the north. Um, but if you look in down around the end of the intersection over here, you can see the curve. Bowery Beach Road is actually over here. But the ability to see cars coming in the other direction is really blocked by this vegetation, dense vegetation, which is right here. That, in our view, bec whoops, becomes a bit important. If you look in the other direction, it's fairly open. Again, this is looking north. Um, and the church is here, obviously. And the field, this is a plowed field um, that is used by, um, I believe it's the Sprigs in the summertime for um, agricultural purposes. So what we took a look at was, as I said, one of the issues we thought was sight distance and the ability to see oncoming vehicles. We took a look at available sight distance at this intersection if you're driving, coming, particularly coming from uh, the Scarborough end and looking around that curve as I, as I indicated by that photograph uh, where, the, where the trees uh, do obstruct your sight distance. And we came up, if, looking at design guidance, these are, these are values that um, are recommended for design of new construction. Um, and they don't necessarily, if you're dealing with existing conditions, um, you know, lots of times will sort of modify kind of things a little bit. But if you, were, if you were building a new road here, these are some of the distances that you might um, try to achieve in order to make the visibility of the drive through the intersection uh, as safe as possible. So what I've done here is, this is an aerial view of uh, the intersection. Again, Scarborough End is over here, Cape Elizabeth is over here, uh, and Spurwink Avenue is here. So the first thing we did was we said, all right, if you're approaching from, if you're approaching from Scarborough, um, and, and you happen to be, oh, maybe a couple hundred feet um, north of the intersection, what you'll see here, this is the uh, maximum decision site distance. This is a line that if you're driving, you'd really like to see all the way over to here. Uh, this is what we call an average um, site distance, decision site distance measurement. And this would be a stopping site distance measurement. Or if, in a, in, if you had to stop your vehicle uh, for, because you noticed something in the road, kind of how much distance do you need to be able to see that? And again, this is going at 35 miles an hour, which is the posted speed out there. So basically, just keep in mind, there's a, lot of, there's a need for visibility across the field in order to open up what you see in advance of the intersection primarily before you make your left-hand turn to see if, in fact, somebody is coming because you don't necessarily need to stop. You might actually be coming up here and just slow down to 10 to 15 miles an hour and make the turn. But again, you have to be wary of, um, is there anybody coming in the other direction uh, as you're trying to make that maneuver? So if the car happens to be a little bit closer to, as you get, approach the intersection and get a little bit closer, again, those particular distances that we're looking at uh, tend to maneuver around and again pass through those sight lines all seem to pass through that vegetation. And if we get up to the intersection itself, basically if you're, I'm sorry, actually let's go back. 
if you're sitting at the intersection, you really have fairly good sight distance for oncoming vehicles, but you don't really achieve that until you get right on top of the intersection and you're ready to make your maneuver. So if we take the average distances, not the maximum, not the minimum, but we pick an average distance, what we end up with is this yellow dashed line here. And this is sort of a, boy, this would be a preferred um, area of clear sight interior to the intersection. And if you had that, if that was wide open and visible, then indeed the safety of making a maneuver to the left or passing around the intersection would actually be at maximum. Now, that's interesting because if you, actually, if you look, this blue line here represents the existing right-of-way or the public ownership of land. So what we're talking about is the ability to be able to view um, across the agricultural field or across property that you don't own. And so that opens up a whole situation of do we um, engage the property owner in terms of possibly um, acquiring a clearing easement, which might mean the removal of some vegetation to open up the sight lines. But again, you need to have some conversations with the property owner because you don't own the land. So that's the sort of the purpose of this sort of exercise. So if we're going to deal with sight distance, indeed, um, it may in fact involve some vegetation clearing on the inside um, of the curb. And that happens to be on land that you don't own. Now, as we said, another problem with this intersection is the um, gradient or the cross slope of the road as you're going around the curb. Now, what we did here is we said, well, <clears throat> the posted speed on Bowery Beach Road at Route 77 is 35 miles an hour. So if we were designing this as a brand new roadway, 35 miles an hour would suggest that the radius of this curve that would represent going around the corner needs to be 340 feet. That would give you this alignment. And as you can see, the existing alignment is up here because the existing alignment, the, the curve radius is about 150 feet. So it's much sharper than what would be proposed if you were designing this as a new road. So we said, all right, if we went a one step further and said, okay, um, let's suggest that maybe we try to achieve this 340 foot curve, smooth it out a bit, and then create a cross slope across both travel lanes. So if you're heading to Scarborough, it's actually gonna be banked in the right direction. What does that really mean? Well, as I said before, this blue line, which is here, represents the limit of the land that you own. So what we would suggest is probably you would move, want to move that line to something that looks like this. And the area between the blue line of what you own now and the red line of what you might want to own is about 3,000 square feet. And the limit of the agricultural land is actually here. So it's possible that you could approach your butter and say, gee, would you be willing to sell us 3,000 square feet? Um, and it appears that that acquisition might not impact their particular operation of the plowed field because it doesn't look like they're using that area. But again, we're sort of... Um, moving to a place of um, acquiring land and in a, you know, obviously I don't know that you'd be willing to do this on a um, eminent domain thing, but it was, if there was a, if there's a willing party, willing seller, willing buyer, maybe you would, you'd be interested in making some improvements on the alignment. Now that's not to say that um, well, it, the other advantage of that, let me say that, if you did that, then basically what happens is this intersection or spur wink actually gets pushed out a little bit further. So as you're stopped at the stop line, you actually now can see beyond the church and people can see you better. So that's a good thing. 
in terms of uh, safety and visibility here on operations here. The other thing is that by doing so, the other uh, point I talked about was the pedestrian access from the grass parking lot over here to the church itself. Today there's a break in the fence right here. And what I didn't show you is that if we go back, yeah, and it's, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see here. This, the break on the fence is about here and the cross, so people cross right here. Well, it's pretty close to where this stop bar is or where vehicles are stopped. So they're almost hidden by the church. So if we were to change the alignment, I think we pick up, you know, 25 to 30 feet or so and you could maintain that crosswalk at the same location. If you decided not to realign the road, then we're suggesting that maybe the crosswalk gets pushed further away from the intersection, just to give people who are making that turn um, a little bit of room to react to a pedestrian crossing there. And then obviously the other thing to do is to actually paint a crosswalk, which I don't believe exists today. So that would sort of indicate again to drivers that indeed um, there could potentially be some pedestrian activity and that they need to be wary of. So, so where are we? I think the issue is on one end of the spectrum, you could realign the road, um, create a, an opportunity for a smoother um, crossing around the corner on Bowery Beach Road. You'd have the ability to uh, super elevate it as we term it or bank it in the proper direction so that it would be it would feel comfortable going around the road um, and that could be that the radius of the curve would be designed at what we thought was an appropriate speed now again it's posted at 35 miles an hour what I showed you was 35 miles an hour depending upon the receptiveness of the abutter we could actually tighten that up a little bit maybe we make it for 30 miles an hour or make it for 25 or so so you've got a little bit of flexibility there but the one end of the spectrum on terms of expense would be realignment of the road itself. If you didn't want to do that, that doesn't mean that you can't do something. Um, if you wanted to leave the, the roadway at the existing horizontal alignment, maybe we could change the super elevation of the outside of the curb so that indeed it was banked in the right direction so you felt a little more comfortable. Uh, we could try that. We could put some centerline rumble strips so that if you happen to vary around the curve, you know, there's a, there's a reason, hey, slow down. Um, we could add, there are some approach signage there on those curves. Um, they're, they're yellow and black signs that, that indicate 30 miles an hour going around the curve, even though there are advisory um, indications, whereas the posted speed is 20, uh, 35, they are advisory plaques for 30. We could make those actually dynamic, and you may have seen those. The sign will tell you what your speed is and indicate what you know the advisory speed is suggested. So you have some way to gauge yourself that indeed maybe you're going a little too fast. Um, there were also when we were out in the field, we were talking about how could we protect the church, um, particularly since the road is on the uh, uh, is on the church is on the outside of the curve. Um, and it had been hit before and one of the things we noticed is there's a beautiful stone wall that lines the cemetery out in the rear it's possible that you could extend that wall maybe down the, the down the face of the church and provide some sort of protection to the building itself um, and then as I've already talked about um, you know maybe there's some mo movement in the crosswalk uh, location just from a safety point of view so in short or actually in long and I'm sorry for taking quite a long time to go through this um, we looked at a variety of things. I think you have a variety of uh, possibilities that you can consider, and they range all the way from very simple and inexpensive to very costly and expensive. And some of them would involve additional land and some of them would not. So we're here to, to or, or prepared to sort of take your direction at this point, and then we will continue further and maybe report back when we, when we have more concrete solutions. But I think what we're looking for is a little bit of guidance from you folks in terms of how big an issue do you see this is in terms of um, what your expectations were. So with that, I will Thank entertain you. any questions. <coughs> Thank you. I did just want to say one more thing. When we received the report, we provided a copy of it to the Sprague Corporation. We have not entered into a dialogue with them uh, Okay. Figuring the council lot have a chance to see the report, but the, the initial 
email that came back was, you know, a, an indication of uh, willingness to uh, work with us. Great. Thank you. Questions? No? I have a couple questions. Yes. Um, thank you very much for presenting that. That was very sure. informative. Um, the current striping, the, the current sign, stop sign and striping on Spurwing Avenue as you approach the intersection is, has always puzzled me. And if memory serves, the stop bar that's painted on the pavement is a fair distance from the actual stop sign, which causes confusion, I think, among drivers. There's, there's the stop bar, and then there's an actual posted stop sign, I think. On and the stop sign is further. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what happens, I think a lot of people stop at the bar, or maybe roll through it, and then inch up to the sign, and they're not yep. sure, well, I already stopped back there. So I think <laughs> I mean, one of the things I would say is adding some consistency to that would mm -hmm. help. Yep. I'm curious also what you observed about other signage either along 77 or along Spurwink as you approach the intersection that would indicate dangerous curve or you know any of those other types of things that might alert a driver to uh, you know an, an again there are the, I, to my knowledge I don't remember that there's much else uh, there is a sign down here as you're heading uh, uh, southerly I always get this wrong backwards uh, and there's a sign over here as you're heading northerly that in advance of the curb they're yellow and black they have a curb sign mm -hmm. and they have an advisory speed plaque that indicates 30 miles an hour but that's basically it uh, my suspicion is that you know this like many coastal routes has lots of curves and turns and you know people here are accustomed to driving it which is probably why we don't see a more um, of a history in terms of crashes than actually seems to be documented I, I just yes if I could mention you know there's, there's options listed on the screen but you know one option is simply to deal with the property owners you know can we work together on the brush and you know clear away a little bit to, mm -hmm. to make it a little bit safer that's mm -hmm. that, that's an easy uh, exactly solution uh, secondly uh, PACS which is the regional funding agency once every two to three years uh, requests you know do you projects we will look at uh, and whatever the next deadline is January 22nd you know if we if we did that and, and tried to get in the pipeline for them to to do the other piece uh, you know it still wouldn't happen for like four years the way if if the way PACS works uh, some things take even longer than that so you know I think that's an issue is you know do you want us to get into that pipeline and, and but I think even before that is do you want us to enter into a dialogue with the the property owner Yes, Sarah. I'm not sure if we're deciding this right now, are we? Are we going to vote on whether or are we going to have further discussion about all these options? How are we going to settle it? There's no motion on the table. It's just to report just this evening. It's not intended, but... Because I guess my thoughts are that we could do this in a gradual fashion. We could cut down the brush, assuming the sprigs are open to that. We could put up a couple just sign basic signs that cost almost nothing that say dangerous curve ahead please slow down whatever we could i like that crosswalk idea a little further down and we could line up the stop crossbar with a stop sign and 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 observe for a year you know if there's zero crashes and zero incidents well that's that seems mm -hmm. like a really good thing if mm -hmm. it's if it doesn't change or it gets worse then we can sort of go in other words we can address this incrementally right we might as well start Absolutely. with inexpensive absolutely test it out i mean yep. i just think those basic things you mentioned might go a very long way i don't I, I i don't recall ever seeing a sign there that sort of says hey be careful well part of it it may be that the vegetation is sort of obstructing yep. the sign yes. so maybe it's Agreed. time to do a little clearing around the sign too uh, but you're absolutely right i don't disagree with your and it's great your, to have this report because then we know exactly what our next mm -hmm. step would be mm -hmm. should that one not be effective <clears throat> The only comment I would make, and in, 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 in I think Mike is probably aware of this, um, the PACS process that he described um, does provide um, monies for the regional communities for projects similar to this. What I'm fearful, though, with this particular project is since we don't have enough crashes, that it's not going to elevate to the point where they would fund it. Uh, so that may be a path that you might not seek any return. If you did want to go 
to a bigger project or a reconstruction project, what I would suggest is a program that the state also maintains, and actually PAX has uh, their own version of it too, which is just starting this year, and it's called the Municipal Partnership Agreement. And this is a program whereby the state, without federal funds, but it's state-only money, will give you 50% the cost of the project. So you put up 50%, the town puts up, I mean, the state puts up 50%, and you do your project. And there's a maximum of 500,000 that they will give you. So they, you know, for a project under a million dollars, you get it 50 cents on the dollar. Um, I can speak from experience. We've done two of those in South Portland recently, and I've done one in Kennebunk and one in um, Kittery also. Excellent project zero administrative function. I probably shouldn't say that too loudly. But from a state-run project, there basically is no state involvement. So it's, it's truly a municipal-run program, and it's very cost-effective, and it's very efficient. Um, but you're talking about projects that are several hundred thousand, and you're going to put in, you know, 150,000 or whatever it is, you know, that you may choose to do. And I think the, the council that talked about taking a more measured approach, if there's no real sense of urgency, may make more sense than going forward and spending lots and lots of money. Uh, but that program does exist, and you should be aware uh, they're taking applications for, I think 2016 is spoken for, but 2017 is available. And they have seven to nine million dollars that they dole out every year. Uh, and most of the communities that take advantage of it are in southern Maine because they happen to be the more um, communities with a little bit more uh, affluence and, and ability to pay. So uh, that's something to consider. You know. Thank you. Patty, yes. I guess I want maybe two parts here. Um, with the PACS program, maybe you can talk a little bit more about what that process is involved, if there's a cost involved. Is it just something that you can put out there and let happen to see if it's something that we did get this, especially if we're going to stage this and starting with just some signage and moving a crosswalk so that if in fact we did decide that there was an issue, we could go about that. Um, and as well, could you do with looking at the, um, the MPI program? I mean, could, is there something that you could do like dual tracks? Can you apply to both? And is there something? No, because they get really mad if they give it to you and you don't use it. Uh, just, you know, I think that's the real issue is do you, you know, we, we, it strikes me we ought to be doing exactly the things that, that Sarah indicated, the, the low-hanging fruit, uh, you know, provided that the property owner is willing to work with us on it since most of it's on their property. Uh, and then, you know, and the issue is do we want to start down the, the road of looking at the geometry of the intersection and the, the fact that the curve goes the wrong way and you know, all that. And, you know, that, that will take time. And, and, that, and, you know, as Steve indicated, the municipal partnership route is, is, is the route to go for funding because it'll, PACS just has so little money available for federal road reconstruction monies, it's uh, practically non-existent. Right. We, we do in no way compete with the Scarboroughs and the Portlands and the South Portlands. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Kathy, did you have a question? I was just wondering if um, any of um, your research had anything to do with walkers and or runners because I know at least one individual who said they felt uh, they'd had a bunch of near misses with cars in that area. And I don't know if you... Yeah. We didn't make any observations the day we were there in terms of that use as a, as a jogging trail or, uh, I mean, do people, are you saying people are actually running along the edge of the road? Yes, yeah. Bowery Beach Road? Right, right. Well, it's pretty narrow. run along there's Bowery much, Beach and up and down. Yeah, Spurway. there's not much of a shoulder there, so I can appreciate that it probably is a, you know, nerve-wracking situation, which, again, the, the more sight distance you have there, particularly around curves and stuff, the better you're going to be. But it, it, there's, it, there's not a paved shoulder, you know, uh, with a fair amount of distance to get off the edge of the road. And the, the same would be for bicyclists, I'm sure. Right, right. Uh, and we did have an accident with, you know, a bicyclist there, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, James. I was actually just going to follow up on that point. So it was curious to me in reading the briefing materials, and you addressed it just now, too, that two of the four incidents involved, you know, other multi multimodal transportation as opposed to just vehicular. Mm -hmm. So um, I, ju I was just wondering in your experience and opinion um, if there was anything sort of additional to be gleaned from from that that, that made it unique that 50 percent of the four residents were. Well, one of the things I would say, you know, it's, it's, it, it's kind of odd, uh, or I mean, it's really interesting if you've ever written 
read a uh, police accident report. Um, what what the officer will put down on you know what they tell him, what the officer will actually write down. Sometimes it's kind of interesting, and then you know I'm sure they're telling it like it is, and and it's interesting, and quite actually quite interesting uh, what what people will say and and what happens. The one accident um, that occurred on um, September 18th, and it was actually um, at four o'clock in the afternoon. So you're talking about daylight um, in the summertime and it was the vehicle um, hitting a bicyclist. And this was actually this one over here. And this is where the bicyclist got injured. Um, and basically it says that unit one was driving north on 77 approaching the intersection with Spurwick Road. Driver of unit one stated he made a last minute decision to make a left turn onto Spurwick Road. Driver of Unit 1 stated he slowed quickly and started to turn when he saw a bicyclist heading south on 77th the intersection. At this point, the driver stated it was too late to avoid the collision. So basically, they turned, didn't see the bicyclist, and then actually had an incident with, uh, with the bicyclist. So that, you know, whether if they had had more, if the vegetation had been cleared, uh, and here, and they'd had more of an opportunity to see the bicyclist coming. I don't know whether that would have made a difference. It sounds like it was a last minute decision that somebody made, and it just happened. Uh, the other one that involved the motorcycle, the motorcycle actually, if I remember right, was following, um, this one occurred in July um, at 2.30 in the afternoon, so again, we're talking about not nighttime, not wintertime, uh, middle, of the <clears throat> middle of the day. Um, unit 2 was traveling south on 27. Uh, unit 1 was making a left turn from Spurwink to go north on Bowery Beach. Uh, a school bus was in front of unit, turn, uh, unit 2 turning right onto Spurwink Road. So a, a school bus was making a right turn here, and it turned out there happened to be a motorcycle following closely behind the uh, school bus, and the person that came out of Spurwink Road saw the school bus but didn't see the motorcycle behind them, pulled out, hit. So um, not something that maybe is geometrically, you know, uh, related, uh, just kind of one of those situations. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. I'm just going to move things along because I see we still have some counselors who have some other questions. If I could just interrupt sure. for a minute. Caitlin. I just, uh, we're going to be starting a dialogue with the Sprague Corp about possibly the vegetation. Maybe we could feel them out at the same time about the 300 square feet. I mean, if we're going to be going after this municipal partnership monies. Can I just, I think it's 3,000 square it's feet. Is that right? 3,000 square, I wrote down 3,000, sorry. 3,000 square feet. Just see what we're looking at for a number. I mean, if we can get half of it from this partnership agreement, it, it just I'd be curious as to know what the number is. So if I'm just sort of getting a sense of what council members are talking about here, what I'm hearing is there's a great deal of interest in maybe giving the manager some direction on exploring some options with the property owner, particularly when it comes to looking at the vegetation and perhaps also on looking at the 3,000 square feet, um, exploring in a little bit more detail the opportunity for packed funding, um, and also I think more interest in looking at moving the crosswalk back and perhaps looking at dynamic signage. Those are, I think, the incremental steps that you were talking about, Sarah, and that longer term, if we have an opportunity or if we see a need to do something more because we're having more crash reports or more incidents, mm -hmm. then it's time to revisit either the grading or the, um, I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong Horizontal word. curvature, yeah. The, yes, mm -hmm. horizontal yep. curvature. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Does that sum it up? Anybody else have anything else that they'd like to add to that discussion? And yes, Jessica. Yeah, I think um, I like Sarah's ideas. I think that what, and as the town manager mentioned, the low hanging fruit, I'd personally like to see us take that approach first. The incremental approach. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, Mike, does that give you enough direction to get started? And do yeah. we need to do something else with 
the report? Do we need to get Acknowledge give receipt of the report. Okay. Wonderful. Could I have a motion to acknowledge receipt of the report? So moved. Thank you, Kathy. A second? Second. Thank you, Caitlin. Any discussion about that? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. You bet. Great. And we will move on to item number 22-2016, confirmation of town manager's appointment of a library director. Yes. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Chair, excuse me. Sorry, I'll, I'll answer to, to either one. I'll Don't get worry. used to it. Uh, very happy to report on the library director search process. I, I noticed Ruth Ann Haley in the group, uh, uh, a member of the, uh, the search committee, the, uh, Ken the, from the library trustees as well. Uh, I think everyone knows Jay Sherman is retiring on January 22nd. Uh, we went through a, a search process advertised in all of the the national publications, uh, lists, the, the online list job places, and uh, we, we ended up with uh, between 30 and 40 applicants. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, but the, the committee, what was interesting is library trustees had gone through, a, I had asked them to make a list of the qualities they wanted to see in a librarian. And they'd come up with a list of about 25 different qualities they wanted to see in a librarian. And then we use that list that the trustees have come up with to, to help with the prescription of the, the job description, to help with the, the ad in the newspaper, to help with the screening in the, the first category. And then after we, we actually, we interviewed by phone, we scheduled six. I don't, we didn't actually end up talking, we ended up talking to four. And then we met two in person. And then we actually went through, and we, we went through all of these different qualities and say which of the candidates met this the best. And it, it was a good process. Uh, in, in my view, the, the committee was very actively engaged. Uh, we, we ended up, as I mentioned, with two finalists. Both were very qualified. Uh, Kyle Nugabauer, everyone's going to have trouble with the pronunciation, uh, and ended up as, as the choice. Uh, I was happy, in the way this works, is the council uh, under the charter is the manager makes the appointment and the council approves. And we always get into this issue with, with all these is, you know, well, you've already announced it. You know, isn't this a foregone conclusion? The problem is if you don't announce it, then you don't have stuff. If someone knew something about this person, they wouldn't have a chance to come forward and say it, uh, you know, unless you, you announce the person. So I think the best thing is to get it out there. And, you know, the good news is, you know, we did a criminal background check. We checked out the references. All those things, uh, everyone uh, is, is full of praise for Kai. <coughs> Currently, the uh, works for the uh, Walker Memorial Library for the city of Westbrook. Uh, before that, he was the library director of a small library in uh, in Iowa. Fairly young guy. Uh, we, you know, we're not allowed to ask the age, but you know, you Google, you find out those things. Uh, but anyway, I, th I think he's uh, going to be a, a good fit for the library. Uh, he. Uh, is someone that you know? I think we, we can mold to to uh, to really you know meet the expectations of what the building committee has discussed over the last few years, what the committee has discussed, what the trustees have discussed, what they the direction they want to see the library going in. And I think he has got all the ingredients, all the bones to get us there. Uh, and I think he'll be a, a great library director for us. And uh, I'm happy to recommend him for approval and. I don't know if Ruth Ann was on the committee if she wants to add anything. Uh, Can you come up to the... <laughs> I really just came in support of Kyle. It was a great process um, <coughs> that Mike kept us all on track, so organized. But he, he, you know, we expected, I don't know what, you know, when we first put out the ad, we got applications from Arizona to Egypt and Canada and all over the place. And who knew we would get some guy from Westbrook? <laughs> it was kind of surprising, but I think he'll be a great fit. He's a really nice guy, and he's delighted to be here. So I think you'll be very pleased. And I look forward to having you all come and meet with him. We open 
first part of February, and there'll be a lot of opportunity to come in and, and meet the new director. Thank you. <clears throat> Would be happy to answer any questions you may have. No questions? Do we have a motion? Yes, Jessica. I move that we accept the town manager's appointment of a new library director. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Patty. Any discussion? Yes, Jessica. I'd just like to thank the town manager and the library search committee for all their work. The committee was fun to work with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. My thanks as well to the committee and to the trustees and to the manager. And any other comments, discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? That's unanimous. You're welcome. And we will move on to item number 23-2016. You're looking at me. Did I see Yeah, I've, I've updated the agenda, yeah. Oh. You got the right one? No. Yeah. Apparently Same I one. don't, but I'm glad you yeah. brought that. Okay. Yeah. Acceptance of gifts. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> it is proposed to accept gifts. Yes, it is. Jeff, Thank you. Jeffrey handles that one. Okay. Yeah. Deborah, did you want to introduce that item? Sure, I'd be pleased to. It's this time of year that we uh, collect from the different departments gifts uh, that have been provided for the, to the community in the last year. Uh, these are both in-kind and financial donations. They range anywhere from local fuel assistance um, to, um, we had some family fun day fireworks, uh, donations, police department, museum at Portland Headlight, the library. Uh, there was um, donated volunteer labor and share of materials for the Winnick Woods Bridge Construction uh, Project uh, and from Mitchell Associates illustrations for land use amendments uh, and a pet waste station. So again, very uh, varied uh, contributions to the town and we certainly recognize and thank folks for that and it would be in order for you folks to accept these gifts this evening. Thank you. Would someone like to make a motion to accept those gifts? Yes, Patty. Sure. I move that we accept the gifts received in 2015, and we do that with appreciation. Thank you. Do I have a second for that? Second. Thank you, Caitlin. Any discussion? I agree. Very nicely put. Accepted with great appreciation. Thank you. All in favor? It's unanimous. And we will move on to item number 24-2016, reuse suggestions for former library building. And would the manager like to introduce that item? I'd be, be happy to. The uh, town council authorized a month ago me to go out and to, to survey the municipal departments and others for possible public use of the building. The, the reason public use is because we'd had a, a survey in the uh, tax bills that indicated that uh, that, that was the preferred use uh, by citizens, 52% of that indicated. As a result of that, you know, we've got a number of suggestions. Uh, the school department submitted a fairly comprehensive proposal for, I think they call it a school hub. Uh, that you've received a couple of emails from those interested in having a senior citizen center there. And, and then there were a couple of other suggestions that if the historical society you know, were to move, what ought to happen with, with the other space. Uh, the, we received a, uh, an email from CEIF, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, who were interested in possibly using it, their offices as well. Uh, you know, I've just merely gathered the recommendations and forwarded them uh, to you. And you know, obviously, I think you, you need some sort of a committee or a working group, either of the whole council or, or as a subset, that uh, you know, comes back with a recommendation as to what you want to do. You might want to engage in a dialogue as well with the school department uh, since uh, you know, they, they had a, a specific concrete proposal. But, but I realize in doing that, you, know, it's, uh, you also have the senior citizen uh, group uh, that went through that. But, you know, but the, the senior citizens, you know, the, the council is going to, you know, look, needs to look at that report. And you know, we, we need to have a dialogue with the school department. And now that you know, they, they just had their caucus and, determine their offices the next year. It's an opportunity to engage with them to discuss overall, you know, we had talked about community services and the role of seniors in that, but that, you know, awaiting the, the change in leadership of the school department has sort of held up the, that dialogue. 
but now that uh, you know, I, I see they just came downstairs. The caucus is over. Uh, you know, there's an opportunity now for the council chair and others to uh, engage uh, with the school department. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to do anything specific other than to acknowledge your receipt of the report. Uh, you know, there may be people here that wish to speak on this as well. Should I be asking for a motion first? Whatever Before? you like. Okay. Could I have a motion first for um, either acknowledging receipt of the report or for something more extensive, either um, acknowledging the report and moving it to a workshop or having another, um, as the manager suggested, a subcommittee or a work group <coughs> working on that? Yes, Sarah. I move that we um, acknowledge the receipt with, with gratitude receiving the report for the suggested uses of the former library building and I think we should just all do it in a workshop but maybe that shouldn't be part of my motion or should it? Let's just receive yeah. it and then have a, a part of my motion. I, I, I move that we, we gratefully receive this and we move it to one of our workshops so we thank have you. a little more time to talk. Do we have a second, second. to that? Okay. Kathy, thank Sorry. you. Any discussion? Any further discussion? Um, I need to ask a procedural question. Is this the time if we have a motion on the table that we invite the public to comment on that? You can do it any time you want to. Thank you. Yeah. Would anyone like to comment? No? Thank you. Okay, any other discussion from the council members? I, I would like to say, you know, it, you keep getting emails on some of these topics, and I would strongly suggest, I think you've got a workshop the first week of January, maybe. This would be yes, the good to put on that workshop. Okay. That's great. So we have a motion on the table that we move this to a workshop, and it sounds to me like the January 6th, which I don't believe we have an agenda for yet, so sure. perhaps that is the right meeting to have that discussion at. Um, any other discussion right now on that motion? No? All in favor? Wonderful. Might be January 7th. Is it? Yeah. I thought it was the 6th, but either way, yeah. we'll see you in January. Thank you. All right, and I think that's done. We'll move on to the citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Do we have citizens who would like to speak to something not on the agenda tonight? No one. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think we are done. Do we need a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Coming up. We have a workshop.